Hi. Um, today I'm talking a bit about um, how you can actually try to figure out how to pass data between different data projects or different data landscapes um, together with Apache Error. Um, a bit of background about me is I'm an engineer at Quantco, we're a data science project company. Um, and the main thing is we work inside customer bases, so we're always facing the different data sources a customer brings to us. And because we're always pulling huge amounts of data, we need to be aware how to pull out this data quite fast. Um, also from open source side, I'm a Apache Arrow and Paquet PMC um, core member or so. Um, I work mostly in Python. Um, normally I'm at those PyData conferences, which are also here in Berlin. Um, I work a bit and interact with R, Java, and other kind of programming languages. And for me, it's important to just get data from these languages or these ecosystems into another one. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter. My handle is there. That's also another source where you can get the slides from and all these other things. So now, first, when writing some new tool like Arrow, it's always good to think about um, do we have actually a problem we want to solve, or are we just writing code because we like to have fun? And in this case, uh, we have a problem because we have different ecosystems. We're here at the Berlin Buzzwords conference. If you skim over the schedule, you see like some buzzwords like Java, Scala, Flink, Elasticsearch, or you see the Scala side of Spark in the titles of the talks. Now, I'm also often at the PyData conferences uh, where people also talk about data. But there, they're more focused on writing code in Python and in R. And they're using tools like Pandas, or they're using the Python or the R side of Spark, but not the, the Scala side of Spark. And if you talk there about distributed computing, people talk about Docker and Dockerizing the things, and about how you can scale your Kubernetes cluster. And there's your third community, which is also quite often forgotten, but the biggest community is that we have a low, huge amount of SQL-based databases with common access protocols like ODBC and JDBC, but also a lot of custom protocols, like even like things that are now industry standard, like Postgres. And if you write something and want to build up um, with a data pipeline which spans end-to-end -end in a customer base, you normally always face all of these three um, like ecosystems, and you need to bring them together. And the one simple thing is always don't talk to anyone. If you want to build an end-to-end -end data product, just write your own custom converters every time you're talking to them. And yeah, you're then normally doing converter writing all the time. And the, the main advantage now we want to get rid of is that we don't spend time on writing custom converters every time, that we have a common base. And actually, if the second time coming at a, new at a project with knowing this data source, knowing enough of data sync, but we haven't have a, cu a custom converter for that, we just want to have an intermediate where we can write everything to it so that we can just avoid writing all those converters. Uh, this is kind of the target picture we had in mind when creating Arrow, that at the top we have our computation engines, at the bottom we have our data sources, and as an intermediate we have just the Apache Arrow in memory, and don't have to take care of every combination of an execution engine and the data storage. And also, we want to have this really fast. So the Apache Arrow project started out with the core idea that we want to have a common column representation of data independent of the language you're working in. So if you're in Java or in C++, you have the same memory structure. So it means that you can change data in memory. Um, on top of this, core idea and specifying the memory layout. We provide libraries that you can access the data structures in a lot of languages. Uh, and as it's a standard, and standards are only as useful as they're actually used, uh, we already provide building blocks that you can connect your ecosystem or build your ecosystem on top of Arrow. And we also have adapters to the things that are out there at the moment. So that actually, you have a standard you can use, and it's actually accessible by the things you have nowadays. The important word in, in the description of Arrow is that we want to have a common columnar representation. Um, this is a really important thing if you think about performance. Um, normally, we have tabular data. Tabular data is quite nice if you look visually at it, but our uh, CPUs and architectures in there 
they only deal with one-dimensional memory, so we can't do 2D addressing and computers just think in 1D. So we always have to decide, do we want to store it row-wise in a 1D layout or do we want to store it column-wise in a 1D layout? And this always depends on your application. So column is not always better. In the cases where we're lo normally looking at it, it's much better. But if you're looking at the case of a web log where you're always interested in one row of your data, which is gives you the, the idea of the web log, the title, the content, and the author, you just always want to fetch one row. So a row-wise layout, that's really good. If you, in the case of um, doing analytics, like selecting my maximum price on a column or calculating the average price of a column, you want to have all values of a column tied together so that if you fetch like 64 kilobytes, which is a typical size of fetching data of memory, uh, into your CPU, you want to have all this prefetching working for you. And also on a CPU, it's quite advantage if you have like four or eight um, values directly in a register, because then you can use these SIMD instructions like AVX and compute that in one or two CPU cycles instead of eight. Um, also, error is a new thing. So we should have looked what is there before that. Is there anything that you can use to connect all these um, data ecosystems together? Legacy tools, new upcoming tools, and that's what we already have. And actually, there is one universal standard, and that is CSV. Uh, CSV is the one thing that's supported in every tool. Every tool has a CSV import on CSV export, and everyone actually spends an awful amount on that, making it really fast. So even though if you look at it, it's a human-readable, not a binary layout, it's row-wise, it has no types, um, but in the end, it's really fast often, because just this a huge amount of engineering went into making CSV fast. But it still has these disadvantages that it's untyped. So if you read a column, you're not sure if it's a string column or is it an int column, uh, or maybe a float column where nobody put dots in the end. And after reading a million rows, there's a 1.5, and you have to convert all your data memory afterwards again. But the nice thing, it works. And often, if you see two data sources, this is the one thing you should use at first, because you will get quite a decent performance. It will be buggy because type, type safety is missing and so on, but it will work. Um, another thing which is gaining a lot of traction is Parquet. Parquet is a nice uh, columnar file format for serializing data. It was quite only limited to the Hadoop sp space like four years ago, but nowadays you get access to it in, in Python, in, in Rust, and so on. So you actually have independent implementations being able to load data in and out. And a lot more vendors are also adding it to their property products so that you also can go there. But it's still not as widespread as the CSV. And still, Parquet is a nice file format. It gives you columnar data, but it has a disadvantage. It still serializes data. So if you're in a process and you want to talk with another process in another ecosystem on the same machine, um, you have to copy this data around. And copying data sounds at first not such a big problem, given that if you're on a consumer laptop, um, it's on average 10 gigabyte per second a copy. But if you look at code and you have a lot of code that is not optimized for not doing a copy, if you're not actually just modifying this data, um, it gets quite expensive. Often, like looking at 10 gigabyte per second, thinking I only have a gigabyte of, of data in my, in my main memory, you often tend to forget that even simple operations quite often copy the whole data, even if you only change the value. Or if you have to serialize, you copy data normally not just once to the new format, but you always have some kind of intermediate structures, and then copies get really expensive. And the other thing is, there are a lot of kind of these data frame classes. Spark has one, there's one in Python, there's one in R. Um, all these data frame implementations, they're uh, called my memory, they give you um, aggregation functions on that, sometimes distributed, have quite a similar API, but a lot of differences, like how are nulls represented, um, how things work with integers or floats, or, or only f integers and floats supported, are strings slow, and that's also a thing where you have to find a common base ground to, um, if you write one algorithm, to make it available in all these languages to all these data frames. Um, in Arrow itself, we have six distinct implementations. We also cross-test. This is quite important because um, 
a lot of people um, have a different language and they don't want to depend on a single implementation. Like often, if you get to go to your C++ program and say, hey, here, here's this Java library, just include it, they will say no JVM in my code. And if you do the opposite to a Java developer saying, hey, just use JNI, they will say, no, I don't want to have stack faults in my code. So please give me some native support. And this, I think most of them are integration tested against each other. Like the newer ones, the C Sharp one is not yet integration tested, so we're still at a le um, level where we're building it up. But the other ones are tested that they actually have the exact same memory layout in all of these languages, so that you actually can pass a pointer from one to another ecosystem. But having the six, uh, six implementations with some wrappers on top is nice. Um, but in the end, you need to talk to people. Because um, building up an, a standard across ecosystems does not just mean you have to integrate APIs, but you also have to talk with people. How are they using that? And what are the use cases? Um, like, for example, if you're looking at the Java community, a lot of things is focused on distributed, either streaming micro badges or um, having a query engine that works on splits and so on. And there you normally think of that if you get a chunk of data, it's 64,000 um, rows. That's the typical size, because that's a thing you can pass on as a worker task of a network. Uh, in contrast, the Python people are often quite focused. I have this huge machine, like 100 gigabytes of RAM. I may have multiple cores, but I still have just one process. So optimizing that everyone works on a huge amount of data at once is a different goal for them. As well as um, um, packaging these things, because some people want to have it natively packaged on their dis Linux distribution, the other ones want to have a jar, and if you include then some, some native code so they can cross-reference between these languages, you also need to integrate that. So that is a, um, quite a big component, which you can see in mailing lists. Um, with a huge non-code contribution, but it's also a thing that happens from time to time a lot face-to-face -face conversations, because even though if you're writing a lot of mail lists, you get quite a lot of misunderstanding between communities, because there are different needs, and quite often people forget that even if both sides work with big amounts of data, um, how they work with them is quite different. Now, to get us actually a bit working, um, we started out building these data structures, but we needed to add some pieces that actually make this usable. Um, one thing that we had as our first feature, and is still, I think, the most popular feature of Arrow, which is actually not so much an Arrow feature, but more a Parquet feature, is that we have vectorized Parquet readers. So in C++ and in Rust, we have since quite some time a reader that can read Parquet files into the Arrow layout, and our data frame implementations later on that just work on that data. And nowadays, we're also adding one in Java, which is still work in progress. There is a vectorized Parquet reader in some of these query engines, which reads Parquet files into Spark or Presto, but into their custom memory layout. Um, the goal here in the Arrow project is that we write some code that reads it vectorized into Arrow memory, and we already have converters from Arrow memory to Spark and Presto. And these converters are low overhead, so it would actually eliminate the overhead of writing several vectorized parquet readers in Java to a single parquet reader, which in all other query engines could use. Um, there are other things we, we built in there. Um, there's like an LLVM-based expression engine on top of um, the error memory so that you can evaluate complex expressions but still be at, at the advantage of a just-in-time compiler. But it's also we're talking about a bit more how can we communicate error structures, not just between processes on the same host, um, but also over network. And we have error flight, which is an RPC framework. It uses gRPC, and you can also use it with the base gRPC client libraries. But we also have our error flight gRPC client libraries, which actually just hook into gRPC, and which give you pointers to the memory of gRPC. Um, where the error, error messages or error data is stored, so that instead of gRPC getting the data, deserializing it, and copying it into its own section where you can access error memory, which is like two or three copies, you actually get the ability to get gRPC data, insert this error hook, and then get to the pointer where in this message stream your error data is, 
which eliminates your copy. So you only just receive the data once and can work on that. And which makes quite a big difference if you have like data that is half the size of your machine. The other thing is we want to build an ecosystem on top of that because you need, if you want to try to make a standard, you want to actually get it and spread around. For that, um, the good thing is t analytics on the TPU is quite new. So doing deep learning on a TPU is a typical thing already for some years, but having tabular data on TPU is new. So there is a project called RapidDS from NVIDIA um, to providing like data frame and machine learning and tabular data. And this is basically just taking error structures on, this, on the GPU, adding some bit of analytics on top, but it's one-on-one -on -one error structure. So you can take an error table from a CPU, just copy it over, and it can directly work on the uh, GPU. And even if you have code that compiles on a G GPU and a CPU, you can just write it um, in this one language, access the same data structure, and just experience other concepts of parallelization. Um, there's Dremio, which is giving a data platform access to many um, data stores as a query engine between, which is working on Arrow. For me, my main use case at the beginning was there is this common database access layer ODBC in C++. In Python, it just returned you um, iterable over rows, which is not a thing I expect as a Python user to get efficient access, because rows um, is really slow. Only the, the native columnar layout that's the thing you actually can use in Python to get speed because Python is interpreted. And so you actually need in the backing like these efficient algorithms. So I wrote with, together with a colleague, a driver, um, to fetch data via this ODBC source and, and C++ convert it to Arrow so that I can directly use it in Python. Um, before that, for me, also the case was the database had a CSV export. The CSV export was like 10 times faster than the Python driver. So getting data faster out of the database meant that we used the CSV export in the background and then imported the CSV in Python again. Um, besides Parquet, the other big use case for Arrow is in Spark. Um, in Spark, um, if you have to serialize data which is in R or in Python, um, send it to the Spark worker, it takes a lot of amount of time because it uses Python's own native serialization protocol, then works over to the network, then uses their Python's own serialization protocol, deserialize, serialize again to, to Scala, and so on. And we've seen things like 2 to 40 times speed up for UDFs in, in Spark when you're not using this kind of like language native serialization, but you actually serialize your data frame or your chunks of the data frame to Arrow, send it over to Spark into the Scala site, and the Scala site then converts the Arrow data into the, the Spark native data structures, and which actually makes some of these languages usable besides the, the native data frame API. But you can now write custom UDFs, and depending on how they're structured, they're actually now in similar speed like if you wrote them in Scala. Um, there are also two projects called Fletcher, which is like quite a typical name if you do something for Arrow. Uh, one is that in Python it was hard to do analytics on strings. Um, Arrow has a standard how to store strings efficiently. Uh, we could use that to finally get um, Python working fast on string data. And the other thing is there are people um, doing research um, and trying to use Arrow as a data structure to get analytics on FPGAs to make it really fast. But this was a lot of talk now about what is Arrow, how is it working, how is it intended, and it's nice. So I put here some slides. Um, the thing is always, does it really work? Um, so I'm trying to give a simple example. Um, one thing that does never work is code demos and presentations. So I did the code, I ran it locally, and I have it on my slides. I'm not attempting to do a code pre presentation because that will, with 90% chance, fail. Um, but I can take a real-life situation. Um, when you're at a client, you have some custom ERP system which tells you you can exit it from everywhere with common interface, but in the end, the common interface is you have a JDBC driver, which is just for people working with Java, which is if you're not working with any Java code, it's inaccessible for you. Um, there are Python libraries that give you access to Java code, but they just give you a very basic, a lot of serialization access to that. So getting a lot of data out is really, really slow. Then we have another team which is getting the data out, cleaning it, 
adding features on top of that, aggregating it to get some statistics. Um, a lot of data scientists taking care that you actually have clean data. And at the end, you have business analytics, people who want to actually look at the data, make like, business reports, basic things, but they're working in our, another language, another tool set, another data frame implementation. And as we always want to pass around a lot of data, we actually care a lot about performance. Um, to get that working, um, I can write code in Java. My Java code um, takes a JDBC result and transforms it to Arrow. Um, it's quite a common thing that we already have a, a secret helper function Arrow, which you can pass in a JDBC connection, your SQL query, and an Arrow allocator, which is a root allocator, which is the last variable here. And there's a Python package called Jipe, which I can use to cite a JVM in my Python process. So my middle line of code here is calling a Java function, which executes an SQL query, gets the result back as a JDBC result set, and transforms it to error memory. Doing that in Java is really performant, because just-in-time compiling and so on. Um, if we would do this in Python, it would be really slow, because we're getting a row-wise result, turning it into Kalma data. But here in the end, we have Java. It's fast, and we get, at the end, an error record batch. And we have a small helper function in the Python side, which can take the Java object and looks at a Java object and just extracts the memory pointers out of that. It doesn't extract the data, it extracts the memory pointers. Um, and in this case, it's important that the JVM is running in the same process um, and gives you a Python object which references the same memory pointers, um, still holds a pointer to this original Java object so that your data is not garbage collected. But then you, you have a record batch. And this error record batch can be transformed in Python to a native pandas data structure. That's what you use as a data scientist in Python. Look at the data. It kind of looks like it's just native there. But in the end, it's actually backed by error memory that was allocated in Java. And in this case, it's a simple two, three rows data set. But actually, the code before transforming it from Java to Python is constant time. So independently, if you have three rows or 10 million rows, it will just take like about 20 or 50 CPU instructions, just tearing out the pointers and putting it into the Python structure. And another thing which is coming up with the next release, which is roughly at the stage that it's halfly compiling for me, um, there is uh, an R package which gives you access to Python code. It just works at the same level like the, the, the type package. You communicate inside your process with, between the two interpreters and get like indirect reference to, the, to these objects. Um, but it gives you the ability that you can, from R, call Python code and get reference to the Python objects. And there's this library reticulate, which gives you a general Python to R function, which often does conversion. But we also can hook up to that and say, I have an, this is all backed by arrows, so I have a C++ pointer. And I can just pass on this pointer from Python to R. And that's all what this function is doing. It's taking the Python object, extracts the pointer inside, and passes it into the wrapper object in R, so that you actually can look at this data here at the end, which was actually in the beginning allocated by a Java process passed through Python, and is now here in R, which is really great for me, because I have my three, three groups of people who work together, and we can pass the data around in a process without copying anything. Most of the cases, the Python um, project will persist, and then the Python code will load data later on, so that Java and, R is no, uh, Java and Python is a process, and R and Python works in a process, but also it gives you the ability to run this all at the same time. But as I said, this R thing is still work in progress. Um, it's actually just five lines of C++ making this working. Um, but as we're in compiled land, um, the code is working, but the compiler flags aren't, so I am currently facing like two out of somewhere between two and ten pages of my display of um, compiler messages for five lines of code, um, which is probably just a single thing missing, but it takes an expert to figure that out. And that's roughly the current state of error. We have um, integration between different languages. The most integration that we test at the moment, quite good, that we actually, in all languages, have the same memory layout so that we don't get any surprises. 
we're building now out that we can pass these pointers from one language to another, either by sharing memory between processes or just handing one pointer to another between different language runtimes in the same process. This also depends on all these libraries which gives you access to JVM, R runtime, and so on in the same process. Um, the next thing which we're looking for is build more adapters so that people actually get access to error data in the applications. Um, my main goal is Postgres adapter at the moment because it seems like JDBC, ODBC, and Postgres is now the, the newest kind of standard of accessing databases. A lot of GPU databases which just gives you a Postgres protocol. And Postgres has an ODBC driver, so it could use my ODBC tool, but the Postgres ODBC driver is really slow. So it gives you small latency, but also small throughput, so sending a lot of data through the Postgres ODBC driver will take also a long time. And the other thing is people want to get access to the data, but actually people also care about it. You don't just take error as an immediate format, but actually work on that. So at the moment, a lot of people are building support for error that you can use error as the basis of your query engine or processing engine, so that you um, have the building blocks to get like reading data into error, making it into splits, and then giving that along to computation engines or doing basic computations already in the error library on these error data frames. And yeah, put a data frame implementation on top. The main difference between the data frame implementation and what we have with error memory is that error memory just gives you columns with fixed types um, and not so much as the end user interface which is also the main problem for us advertising error. Error is mainly meant for people developing data frame libraries and not people who actually work with data frames. So in the end, it will spread hopefully, but the end user will not be faced with that so much. Yeah, that was my basic overview. Um, remember, I will post the slides there, but I think they will also be on the Berlin Buzzwords homepage. But I'm now open for questions. All right, thank you, Uwe. Now uh, we will open the questions round. Who's going to go first? Yes. Thanks a lot for this really interesting talk. Just a, um, a small clarification on the passing data from, from the JVM into, into Python code and so on. Does it have to be um, originally allocated off heap that memory so yeah. that yeah the yeah. garbage collector doesn't move it. Okay. Yeah, error memory is always off heap in Java so that you can have the exact memory layout. Next. Yes. So would that also take care of uh, Java serialization versus Python pickling and the incompatibilities between the two formats? And yes, that's the main performance gain we have between uh, in this Python um, Spark, PySpark and Scala Spark adapters because nowadays they're, they're just depending on them, and there's incompatibilities, mm -hmm. but we're using just for data frames, we're using arrow, and we're just passing this memory point around without this Java Python serializations. Okay. Next. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I just had a noob question, maybe. You said that the JVM should be within the Python process. What does that mean exactly? Um, yeah. That's the trick here. So um, we have Java code. The Java code allocates memory. And if you want to take a memory address um, and pass it on to another function, the memory address is only valid inside the same process. So um, if you want to have um, a memory address valid for Python and for Java, um, I have to run this both in the same process. If I would run it in separate processes, I could still use shared memory, but then the memory addresses would be different between those two processes. And I need to have a process that maps between those two. What does that mean for someone who is just running the Python process? Uh, well, okay. okay. We can take this later, yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? We still have time. Yes. You mentioned that Arrow offers something like LLVM-based analytical microkernels. I'm not sure if I'm remembering that exactly correctly. Yeah. Um, can you elaborate a little more what that is? So we have uh, the, a, a sub-module called Gandiva, 
which takes um, like expressions like um, a plus b um, should be smaller than 1. And this is a very simple expression. But it then um, generates LLVM intermediate code, which executes this expression on three or four uh, arrow columns and generates on-the-fly vectorized code. And the main importance of that is that it generates this vectorized code accessing all these four columns at the same time, meaning that you, you have vectorized code, pulls this data from four columns into your CPU, calculates um, the result, and pushes it back um, as a new column. But it also the good thing is it just through the just-in-time compiling, we actually get the native code for this machine, meaning that we can use AVX instructions, even though the error code maybe was just compiled for working on all machines. Mm. Are you using that, for, for example, for the parquet reader for complex predicate pushdown? Or? Well, we're not using that at the moment. We're going to use that in future, because when we're doing predicate pushdown, we still get back in the parquet reader like the row groups or pages. And we have to deserialize them and to look inside a page. But once you have deserialized that, we have to work on the whole column when we don't have any information like Paquet is giving us for row groups where we can skip those. All right, thanks. Yeah. Next. No one? Yes, we have one. How many data types does Arrow support? How many what? Data types. So I think we're supporting about 20 or so. So the thing is, um, every new data type has to be added to every new um, language implementation, which makes it hard to support more, but we're supporting like um, float and int, and in all variations from 8 to 64 bits. It's like string and unions and structs and lists. And with structs and lists, or no, no, yeah, structs and lists, you can actually build up new complex more data types so you can have native uh, or nested, nested data structures in your columnar data. Um, there's also another extension that you can actually take a type, like, like a variable length binary, and give it an annotation so that if you have a custom type implementation in, in maybe in your code or in two or three of the error implementations that you still can work with that, but you have a fallback so that if you take another error implementation which doesn't know this type or doesn't have the hook to know this type, you can still work on the data and pass the data and pass it around. Okay, thanks. Um, do you also encode the schema in the memory? So we don't have a common encoding for the schema. Schema is a thing that is um, a custom data structure in each language. We have a, way, a standard way to passing the schema around with flat buffer serialization, but um, that's a thing you frequently um, access in the, in the language, so you want to have it 100% in, in the native language code. And yeah, once we pass it around from one language to another, we normally serialize it to flat buffers, but that's mainly implementation detail and not part of the standard. Okay, okay. anyone else? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, now that you actually mentioned flat buffers, um, is, is, the, is the columnar layout the main advantage, you would say, in, in, in Arrow over things like flag buffers or Captain Proto or so, like other formats where you can exchange without so the conversions between languages? Or what else would you say are the advantages of Arrow? The main advantage is definitely the columnar layout. So flag buffers is quite generic, and we're using it in the schema passing around because it has this zero serialization or copy overhead, but we're actually focusing on this columnar thing. And there's a bit more explanation to this flat buffers thing, which I don't know out of my head, but we have that in our FAQ. We still got time. Any other questions for Uwe? So then I would ask one or two. Um, <laughs> so you said that Arrow does uh, work really well for processes that are on the same machine communicated, but you also showed us this, how was it called, error? Flight. Flight, yes. Yeah. So is it also good, or is there also a use case where I can use it um, like within a distributed system? Yeah, so the, the flight one is one where you have um, like a service which, where you want to talk to it, um, which gives you custom optimizations on top of gRPC, so you don't copy the data. But in general, um, if you don't use flight, you, you have to bring your own um, kind of communication code. Um, but 
network is in, in if you, the distributed fashion normally fast enough to push around the data in the uncompressed form. Um, then you could, can use Arrow just to have one process push the data to another process. If you're in an HPC setting, you may even have this kind of fancy features that you can access memory of another machine. If you don't have that, um, you should measure your network performance, and then you can just take advantage of just copying the code or sending it to the network device and receiving it on the other side without having the serialization overhead. Um, quite often, depending if you have a slow network, it might make sense to compress or serialize. But that's always a trade-off you have to look at if it's worth for your system. OK, thank you. And uh, <laughs> maybe another question about like the, the future of uh, Arrow. So if you go to your last slide, I think you mentioned that, uh, yes, exactly, you want to build more uh, adapters, um, but you also want to like push people to work on top of Arrow. So what is more like the direction? Should every execution engine handle arrow data to have this real zero copy? Or are you more into like building adapter adapters for every system? I think for the project, it depends on who you're speaking for. For me, it's important to get rid of all these adapters because that's my daily problem. I have all these adapters. They're all slow. And I just want to have a huge amount of data and fast and don't write custom code. Um, the really nice thing is, if you want to make more use of that, um, the data structures are quite similar to what are actually nowadays in the, all these processing engines if they're taking like working on Colmer data. They all look like, like small glitches where one doesn't match the other one, but the structures are generally all the same. So um, it's quite a natural choice to build analytic on top of that. Um, if you're working in an engine, you can just um, take error as a baseline, try to ingest it, try to work on it, but maybe also add, just add, while it's inside your application, your custom things on top of that. For example, error is um, always talking about that data, if you get through error, should be immutable, so you shouldn't make any modifications to that. But if you have an engine where actually it makes sense and you know that you can do that and work um, inside the data and make just a sing single cell modification, you can do that in your engine, then you're violating the error standard, but as nobody from the outside is seeing that, you can just do that there, and you're better off, probably. All right, thank you. Any other questions? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry, uh, just a quick follow-up on the um, using Arrow for, for like RPC between machines. Aren't you getting into all this, um, in this mean realm of worrying about NDNS, about different requirements for memory alignment and different architectures and so on, and once you have to kind of standardize across that and then make sure you obey like a common format, aren't you losing half of the benefit of what Arrow is meant for in the first place? Just wondering. So we, we have in the fixed standardization that it should be 64 byte aligned the memory in Arrow, so that we're getting a kind of common base ground for the alignment. Um, the NNS fix is quite simple at the moment. It, all implementations are little Andean. So if you come into the world of big Andean, you have to take care of fixing all these things. And then we have to talk about writing converters. But at the moment, all data is just little Andean. OK, thanks. OK, then I guess we sum up this uh, session by thanking Uwe. Thank you, Uwe.